Здравствуйте, товарищи. Welcome to Russian Through Propaganda. We're on day 54 today. And before we do a bit of review, we need to introduce uh, a completely new type of noun. Uh, we're going to call these nouns e-nouns. And I've got to let you in on a little secret. Right up to now, you've been told a bit of a white lie about Rus Russian nouns, namely that if we see a noun ending in a soft sign, it's a soft masculine noun. Right? So those are the only uh, type of noun we've seen so far. Uh, ending in a soft sign, right? And so we made comparisons going all the way back to like day four or day five, right? That uh, hard masculine nouns end in a hard consonant and soft masculine nouns end in a soft consonant, namely in a soft sign, right? And that's all true, but unfortunately, there's another class of, a, a fairly large class of very important Russian nouns that are feminine nouns and they end in a soft sign. Now, already you can tell one of the main difficulties here is simply knowing what are we dealing with, right? When we look at a noun that we've never seen before, are we dealing with a masculine soft noun or a feminine uh, noun that ends in a soft sign, right? And the answer is there's there's really no way to know that for the most part, right? Uh, so this is one instance where we, we're going to have to learn the gender of the noun sort of as, as part of learning the noun. And we know that generally in Russian, we're quite lucky. That's usually not the case. Usually you can simply look at the noun and know the gender, which is a lot easier than in other languages like French or German, for example, right? But there are instances where the gender is ambiguous, and again, you simply would have to know what the gender is, right? So from now on, when we see now it's ending in a soft sign, that would be, of course, in the nominative, right? If we change the case endings, it could be some other ending, but more on that later. Um, we see now noun ending in a soft sign in the nominative. Uh, we're going to have to figure out, is it a soft masculine or is it this new type of noun, which we're going to refer to as e-nouns, feminine e-nouns, or simply e-nouns for short. Uh, we'll talk about why that is in a moment. But from now on, when you hear this term e-noun, learn to associate it with feminine, right? All e-nouns, with only one possible exception, that's actually just an irregularity, only one possible exception, all e-nouns are feminine, right? So all e-nouns are feminine. Don't forget that. Let's look at our poster today, and we see an early example right off the bat. Maladioj na stadioni. Okay, so here's a new word we haven't seen, maladioj. Now, we may guess that that's related to the word, the adjective maladoy, and we'd be correct, right? So maladoy means young, maladioj means youth, right? The youth. And it happens to be a feminine e now. Now, again, looking at this new noun here, we have absolutely no way of knowing that. We would have to look it up in a dictionary. Now, of course, if we happen to have a, a, a say, a past tense verb or an adjective, right? There may be contextual contextual clues that would tell us what the gender is, but in this particular on this particular poster, we don't have anything, right? Uh, simply the noun and the nominative, maladjoš, and then the phrase nastadioni, right? To the stadiums. Uh, okay, so let's look at a, uh, one example of a feminine e noun, right? Here's the table of the forms in the nominative singular, right? We've got to backtrack a little bit and learn these forms. Uh, how these verbs, these nouns decline in the singular uh, before we go into the plural. Uh, so, for example, viesh. Viesh is a noun meaning thing. And we talked a little bit about, uh, yesterday or the other day in, on day 51 when, when we reviewed pronunciation, we said that there are certain um, consonants in Russian, and sh is one of them, that don't have hard versus soft variants, right? There's only one sound represented by this given letter, and in those cases, it, it's quite superfluous in, in a phonetic sense to write the soft sign in this word, for example, viesh, right? So note that this in this particular word, that soft sign is not affecting the pronunciation at all. So what is it doing there? Well, we'll see if we look on the next page, right, that all these feminine e nouns end in a soft sign. So here that, that soft sign, even though in modern Russian, it's no longer phonetically necessary or even at all relevant, right, it is giving us a little visual clue uh, as to the type of noun we're working with, namely an e-noun. Now, if we look at the genitive form, uh, which you may recall that most good dictionaries will give you the nominative singular form and then usually the genitive ending or the entire genitive singular form if there's some other kind of irregularity or something. And that genitive ending will clue you in often as to what type of noun you're dealing with. In the case of an e-noun, you see the genitive, for example, vieshi, the genitive ending being e, and that's your that's a dead giveaway that you're dealing with a feminine e noun, right? Uh, so here's the the full uh, declension there in the singular viesh, vieshi, viesh is the accusative, 
you might want to circle that. That's a fairly common mistake, right? Uh, now, if you remember our old rule for feminine nouns in the accusative, we remember that the rule is a becomes u, ya becomes you, right? So uh, it kind of makes sense here that since the nominative doesn't contain an a or a ya, how could we turn that into an u or a you, right? Uh, you know, it just the rule doesn't make sense anymore. So basically, in the accusative, these nouns don't change their form. They're the same as in the nominative, because again, they're feminine nouns, and the only rule for making feminine uh, forms accusative is if there's an a, we change it to u. If there's a ya, we change it to you. But if there's no a or ya, we just leave it as is. Okay, the next two forms, dative and prepositional, are both vieshi. And finally, the instrumental, another somewhat peculiar ending, vieshu. And note we keep the we keep the soft sign there. That's a tricky little spelling issue. Uh, you definitely want to learn that again because these these enouns are not some obscure topic. They're extremely common, and so this is not a sort of optional knowledge. We really need to master this uh, paradigm here. Uh, so anyway, you see why we we call these enouns specifically because of the genitive singular ending. But we see that in fact a number of case forms here end in this in this very conspicuous ending e. And so it's quite helpful to think of these nouns like viesh as e nouns, taking e not only in the genitive, but also the dative, singular, prepositional, singular, and as we'll see uh, soon enough in the uh, nominative plural as well. Okay, let's look over a few common e nouns. And again, there are really quite a few of these. This is by no means a kind of, a, you know, a limited number of nouns. These are just a few. And today we're kind of looking at uh, some health-related vocabulary, body-related and uh, so here are just a few uh, fairly common examples. Let's read over them. And again, note that uh, normally, of course, the soft sign we're writing would affect the pronunciation, assuming that the, the final consonant has a hard versus a soft variation. But again, in nouns like viesh, uh, there, it actually is not affecting the pronunciation. So, for example, let's read through these. Žizn, smirt, molodist, starist, Kost, radost, viesh, chast, brof. Remember, there's some devoicing, right, from v to f, right? So brof, tetrad, kravat, mebel, bol, baliezn, piechin, grud, noch. Now, there's another example, right? There is no hard versus soft ch sound in Russian, so this is simply noch. That soft sign is not affecting the pronunciation in any way, but again, you see how it's quite convenient to continue writing that. Um, and finally, a dvier, dvier. Okay, let's try a few of these enouns in the singular, uh, right, following the paradigm back on page 14. Okay, what is, he write, what is the author writing about, or what is the writer writing about in his notebook? Okay, now remember, all of these nouns here in the exercise are E nouns. Titrad uh, is a notebook. A chom pishet pisatil swaye titradi. Titradi. Okay, get rid of the soft sign, of course. Uh, number two. Uh, do you know what they say in Russia about starist? Oh, sorry, I, I missed the second uh, part of the little dialogue here, right? So, what is the writer writing about? He's writing about, over there to the right, he's writing about the death of Stalin. Right, on Pishit A Smirti Stalina, A Smirti Stalina, about the death of Stalin. Number two, do you know what they say in Russia about old age, about starist? And by the way, you can tell that that derives from the adjective starry, right? Starist is the state or the quality of being starry. So from old, we get old age. And by the way, there are quite a few. We, we see actually two or three examples in the word bank up there on page 15 of e nouns ending in oist. Now, if you see nouns like that, especially if you can see that they're derived from an adjective, you may know, you can be certain that those are feminine e nouns, right? That those are e nouns. So in some cases, we can simply look at a, an e noun and recognize it as the feminine e noun that it is. Okay, anyway. Well, they say that starist niradist, old joy, is, sorry, old age is not a joy. Right? It's just a little saying in Russian, apostolovitsa, starist niradist, old age is no joy. 
Number three, uh, about what did you dream in your youth? Let's say I dreamed about a happy life. A shislivoy zhizni. A shislivoy zhizni, right? Prepositional. Number four, I've gotten sick. I can't even get up out of bed. Okay, is, we'll take the genitive, right? Kravats. There's another, a new uh, e noun meaning bed. Я заболел. Даже не могу встать из кровати. Okay, let's ask a question. Do you have pain in your uh, chest? У тебя есть боль в груди? В груди. Okay, so боль, that's an e noun there in the uh, uh, nominative, right? Is there pain at you, literally, in your chest, right? So prepositional, в груди. And that's a somewhat unusual example of a, an in-stressed uh, e noun, right? V grudi, that particular form happens to stress the ending. That's typically quite unusual for these e nouns. Okay, anyway, number five. Uh, this is the is this the end of the first part of the film? Chaist, meaning part, is an e noun, and here we need the genitive, right? The end of the first part of the film. Это конец первой части фильма, right? Uh, да, посмотрим вторую часть. Yes, let's watch the second part. And again, there's an example of the accusative, right? Let's watch the second part. We see that the um, the adjective, вторая, вторая часть, is going into the accusative, though you would expect, of course, for a feminine, right, an adjective modifying a, a, a feminine noun. Accusative is вторую, right? Вторая becomes вторую, but with the noun itself, часть, there is no a or ya to change to u or u, so it simply remains chaist. Okay, let's look at a few verbs for talking about health. And again, uh, the rest of today's lesson is going to be mostly, uh, well, not entirely, but a bit of review about some, just a few key topics related to verbs. Uh, by the way, let's look at a poster. Наши дети не должны болеть по носами. Our children should not have diarrhea, right? As a good Soviet child should not suffer from diarrhea, unlike arguably all of those nasty capitalist children, right, who deserve all the diarrhea they get. So, наши дети, our children, не должны, right, they should not болеть, they should not be sick with, and uh, panosi is uh, here in the uh, the plural, right, with diarrhea, panosami. Instru that's instrument or plural, by the way, which, of course, we haven't studied yet, but we will learn that later in this uh, book. Okay, so three useful verbs for talking about health. Chustovich sibya means literally to feel oneself. And that's, in English, we'd simply say, I feel good, I feel, you know, how are you feeling today? In Russian, the idiom is to feel oneself. Uh, now, that's a bit, bit peculiar because normally we would just expect the sia, right, to, to simply have a reflexive verb, maybe, meaning, uh, you know, to feel oneself in a reflexive sense. But somewhat unusually, uh, here Russian uses the full pronoun form, right? The full separate pronoun form accusative for oneself, namely sibya. So that's reasonably unusual, and we just kind of have to learn that as part of this verb, right? Chustovich sibya means to feel oneself. The verb itself, chustovich, is an ova verb, so we say chustvu sibya, chustvish sibya, etc., the second verb is baliet, zabaliet, the pair here. And you see that's a ye verb, right? Uh, so conjugating that, we get balieu, balieish, baliet, etc. Now don't confuse that with an, a verb whose infinitive is identical, baliet, but uh, that is a, an, a ye verb, a ye verb, right? So, uh, and actually that's only used in the third person. We'll see why in a moment. Well, basically, it means to hurt or to ache. So the subject of this would always be a body part, basically. Right? So my head hurts or my legs hurt. Uh, that would be the way this verb would be typically used. And so we end up only with uh, third-person forms, namely balit baliat. Balit baliat. So here are a couple of examples. Как ты себя чувствуешь сегодня? How do you feel today? Literally, how do you feel yourself today? And uh, it's a fairly typical you know, how are you doing question in Russian. Uh, here's a typical answer. Плохо, я кажется, заболел. Bad, it seems that I've begun to be sick, right? So заболеть, that perfective means it's an inceptive perfective, meaning you've come down with something, right? You've gotten sick, you've begun to be sick. You've begun to болеть. 
Okay, Baliesh, что с тобой? Что болит? You're sick? Are you sick? What is with you, literally? What's wrong? What hurts, right? What is hurting you? Что болит? Here's a typical answer. Голова болит, right? My head hurts, singular. Ноги болят, my feet hurt, or my legs hurt, by the way. Uh, that word naga, which we'll learn here in a moment, uh, can mean feet or leg in Russian. Okay, so uh, let's practice this a little bit by uh, introducing some nominative plural forms. Uh, so uh, let's look at the mo- the model here, right? For the word for child is ribionek, which actually has an irregular, a completely irregular uh, nominative plural, dieti. You may recall that that type of um, irregularity is called suppletion, meaning that these uh, we think of this as a single word in Russian, right here in the singular and the plural, but we see that the singular form and the plural form are actually completely different words, right? And they've kind of merged into one uh, in terms of modern Russian usage. That's called suppletion. Anyway, let's look at some uh, examples here. How does the child feel? How does the child f- child feel itself? Now, what would we ask in the plural? Right? How do the children feel themselves? How are the children feeling? And we could follow that up with uh, some pronouns, right? On zabaliel, meaning the child has gotten sick, or ani zabalieli, meaning the, they, the children, have gotten sick. Okay, so look over a few of these, and again, this is kind of a preview of the nominative plural. We're going to talk more about forming the, the this uh, these case forms actively tomorrow. But uh, we're going to see here that for masculines and feminines, the basic rule, unless, again, it's irregular, is uh, we add u for hard nouns and e for soft nouns in the nominative plural for both masculines and feminines. Now, of course, we have to watch out for the seven-letter spelling rule, right? There may be cases with certain hard feminine nouns where we're writing e in the plural, or even though they're hard, right, just because of what we call the seven-letter spelling rule. Okay, so let's look over uh, a couple of these and just, we won't do all these examples. It's almost too simple. But let's take the singular student, right, a male student. The plural is studenti, right? So there's that typical hard ending in the nominative plural, right? And we could ask, uh, right, how is the student feeling? Or plural, right, how are the students feeling? Well, we could say, on zabaliel, Ani zabalieli. Okay, let's look at a feminine example. Padruga. Okay, that's a hard feminine, but um, again, because of the seven-letter spelling rule, because it ends in that g, we have to write e instead of u. Right? Padrugi. Padrugi. So, kak padruga sebiya chustvuit. How is our female friend feeling? Versus kak padrugi sebiya chustvuit. Right? How are the female friends feeling? We would say using pronouns. Ana zabaliela. Or plural, ani zabalieli. Okay, so let's just read through a few more of the the, for, the nominative singular and plural forms to take a look at them. Sabaka, dog, becomes sabaki, dogs. Sasietka, a female neighbor, becomes sasietki. Tiotia becomes tioti. Aunts, uh, uncles, right? So this is, of course, masculine, but it takes feminine endings. Djadje becomes plural djadi, right, uncles. Father, atiets, has a mobile vowel. It becomes atsui, atsui. Uh, now, again, we are going to see some irregular forms here that we'll talk more about later, uh, but several nouns that refer to just family members, right, some very common nouns, they are irregular in the uh, plural, including in the nominative plural. So, for example, druk becomes druzia. Of course, that's entirely unpredictable, right? Mat becomes matiri. Sasied, which is hard in the singular, becomes very oddly sasiedi, right? Becomes suddenly soft in the plural. That kind of thing is extremely weird in Russian. Uh, number 11, brat becomes bratia. Sistra becomes siostri. Now you see there we have a vowel, a stress shift, which reveals what we would refer to as a latent yo. Right, uh, we know we can't have your in an unstressed position. So sometimes, if the stress shifts onto what looks like a yeah, suddenly it may show itself as a your basically. So again, more on that later. 
Sin becomes irregularly Sinavya, sons, daughter, Deutsch becomes Deutschery, Chelaviek, another irregular, becomes Ludi, Rybionek becomes Dieti, another, again, very unusual form. Again, both 15 and 16, those examples are both suppletive, meaning we can look at these two forms and realize that historically they have nothing to do with each other, really, in terms of the root. Okay, anyway, 17, Jena, Jony, right, another, what we'll call a latent, your husband, Mush, becomes Mujja. And finally, uh, Babushka becomes Babushki, that's regular. Dedushka becomes Dedushki. And one more irregular form, Chazyayan, which means a landlord or a host, kind of the master of the house. Uh, the plural is Chazyayava, Chazyayava. Okay, so we've seen there that some nominative plurals are going to be completely uh, bonkers, basically, just completely unpredictable. But um, for the most part, that's fairly limited, right? So we, in fact, we've already seen some of the most common examples uh, here in this little exercise. Okay, let's do a quick exercise and learn some, uh, some names of some major uh, soccer teams and whatnot here. Um, and th the verb we just learned, baliet, which means to be sick, to be ill, uh, is also used for cheering for a team, right? So the idea is something like you're, you're physically ill for your team, right? That's how much you uh, you, you care about their uh, their record, right? So let's say that in these cities, literally, they are sick for, and then some team names, right? So we're putting the city name into the prepositional, right? In these cities. And then the idiom is to baliet za, right? To cheer for, and za is taking the accusative. So for example, Peterburgia baliet za zinit. They cheer for Zenit. That's the name of the team in Petersburg. And uh, folks in Petersburg are truly fanatical about Zenit. You'll see Zenit gear all over the place. And in fact, they just built a new stadium back in part for the World Cup when Russia hosted the the uh, the, the World Cup. And now that's the uh, home stadium of Zenit. It's kind of out on a little island right on the Gulf of Finland. It's, pretty, it's a pretty uh, dramatic setting there. Anyway, number two, в Москве, right in Moscow, they are sick for Spartak или Dinamo. They cheer for, they are sick for Spartak or Dinamo, right? And those are just two of the major teams in uh, Moscow. And, of course, uh, people in Petersburg especially, they have a rivalry, rivalry with Spartak. Z Zenit dies and the fans hate each other. And uh, there are some rather crude little uh, bits of poetry concerning Spartak fans that I can't repeat here on these airwaves. Anyway, number three, uh, Viroslavlia in Yaroslavl, Viroslavlia, Balier za Lokomotiv. They cheer for locomotive, Lokomotiv. I went to a Lokomotiv hockey game once in Yaroslavl. Anyway, uh, number four, Tulia in Tula, they cheer for, cheer for Arsenal, uh, so named because Tula is a famous... Uh, weapons manufacturer and has been for a very long time. Uh, so anyway, hence the name Arsenal for their soccer team. Ftulia Balieud za Arsenal. Okay, again, another little exercise. This is just really kind of a preview. Uh, let's ask about what's hurting. Now remember that this verb balit, well, the infinitive balit, is really only used in third, the third person balit if something singular is hurting. And baliat, if something plural is hurting. So let's look at these body parts. And again, if they're singular, we'd say, well, this hurts. And, and we'd use balit. If it's plural, we'd say, these hurt, right, baliat. So our head hurts would be galava, balit. Number two, our stomach hurts, jaludok, balit. Nos, balit. Number four, okay, if a tooth hurts, that would be zub, balit. The plural would be zubi, right? So if our teeth hurt, we would say zubi baliat, baliat. If our leg or foot hurts, again, that's the same word in Russian, naga balit, plural, nogi baliat. Again, you may start noticing some uh, sh stress shifts here in the plural. We're going to talk more about that, of course, uh, tomorrow. Ruka balit, right? Our arm or hand hurts. Again, same word in Russian for arm and hand. Versus plural, 
Ruki baliat, right? Our hands hurt. Kaliana balit, that's a neuter, and this neuter plural is actually irregular, very unusual. Um, it, it's kalieni. Uh, so our knees hurt would be kalieni baliat. Uh, plichua becomes plechi. Again, that's very unusual, right? Most neuters will not take e in the plural. We'll say more about that tomorrow. Uh, spina, our back hurts. Spina, balit. Our elbow hurts. Lokit, balit. Lokti is the plural. Lokti, right, with the, the uh, mobile vowel dropping out. Lokti, balit. Nogit, our fingernail. Uh, Nokti would be the plural. Guba becomes gubi. Again, note the stress shift. Can you detect a pattern there? Uh, again, if you... You may sort of guess what, what's the pattern, and we'll uh, confirm that hopefully tomorrow. Yazlik is tongue, as we know, it also means language. Paliats becomes palsi. Note the ye dropping out, but the, the L remains soft, so we write a soft sign there. That's a little spelling uh, trick uh, that we only see with L, by the way. There are other letters like N, for example, that may seem like it should be soft, but we don't write a soft sign. There's a little bit of inconsistency there in terms of both the pronunciation and the spelling uh, when a mobile vowel drops out. Anyway, more on that later. Anyway, glass has a plural, uh, an irregular plural. Glaza means eyes. Ucha, an irregular plural. Ushi, sierza is heart. Piechin, liver. Ribroa becomes robra. So that that actually is a more typical neuter plural. We'll see tomorrow that most neuters, as we know, end in o in the singular. O becomes a in the neuter nominative plural, right? So that's the ending we usually expect, actually, even though in this little exercise here we've seen already a couple of exceptions. And we see here also with the neuter, we're getting a stress shift, which reveals a latent yo. So you're already seeing that in the plural, we're getting a lot of little oddities, right? We're getting some, some completely irregular forms. We're getting these latent yours popping up. We're seeing, of course, mobile vowels drop out. We're seeing all kinds of weird things. And that's really the major reason why I decided in writing these books not to use plurals right off the bat. Because if you, again, you think back to like day five or what in chapters one and two, when we were learning first the nominative, then the genitive, it was hard enough just dealing with changing these case endings let alone a bunch of irregularities, which, you know, most of the serious irregularities in the Russian case forms pop up in the plural. Now, the good news is that typically any, any irregularity you see in the nominative plural is going to carry across all of the remaining plural forms. So, uh, again, it's one of these cases where when we start the nominative plural, we're getting a lot of weird stuff thrown at us. Uh, but luckily, the worst will be over at the end of this chapter. And when we get to the remaining cases, we're going to see that typically they don't do anything weird that we haven't already encountered in the nominative uh, plural. Okay, let's move on. Uh, uh, let's do a quick review of aspect and tense. Right, and let's take again this verb balet, zabalet. And uh, we already mentioned that zabalet is perfective, but that's a, a somewhat unusual type of perfective that we could call an inceptive perfective, meaning Again, perfective verbs we usually think of as describing completion, but some of them are best thought of as describing the beginning of some prolonged act activity or state or whatever. Okay, now let's hear, we've just taken these two examples, right? Baliet, zabaliet, and then another new verb, vuzdaravlivich, vuzdravyet, which means to get well or to recover, right? And we see their, their conjugated forms, and we also see examples of all of their uh, tense forms, right? Uh, the singular, for example, yabalyeyu or yavizdravlivoyu, right? I'm sick or I'm getting well, right? The present tense there, always imperfective. We know that always imperfective because it's by definition still ongoing, right? Now, in the past, we could have either aspect, right? For example, yabaliel, yabaliela would be feminine, I was sick, right? I was in the state, the condition of being sick versus yazabaliel, yazabaliela, that's perfective, meaning I got sick, sort of, you know, bam, I got sick, uh, something changed, right? My, my condition changed, I got sick. Okay, compare that to yavuzdaravlivol or yavuzdaravlivola, 
I was getting well. Now, that's a good example of uh, the past continuous in English, right? I was in the process of recovering. I was getting well versus perfective. I got well, bam, right? I'm well now. I'm, I'm, uh, that process is now complete. I'm now well. Uh, okay, finally, future tense, right? Future tense can also be both either aspect, right? If it's imperfective, we form the future using our helping verb, right? Budu, budish, budget, etc. Versus the infinitive, right? No, we use the infinitive, not some conjugated form. So we get, for example, ya budu balietz. Okay, that could mean I will be sick either one time, right? I, I will be in a in a condition of being sick, or it can mean I will be sick repeatedly, right? Uh, anything that the imperfective could normally imply right here simply in, in some future tense time frame. Versus ya zabalieyo, that means I will get sick perfective. Again, uh, here understood as an inceptive, right? I will come down with something, a one-time uh, change of condition. Okay, examples with getting well. Ya budu vizdoravlivich. Different ways we could translate that. I will be getting well. I'll be in the recovery process, right? I'll, right? I'll be in this ongoing process of getting well. So that's all imperfective. Versus uh, perfective. Ya vizdoravlivich. I will get well. Uh, meaning completely, successfully, right, one time, a one-time recovery. Okay, so that's just a quick overview of pretty much all we know so far about uh, aspect and and how to form the different tenses. We reviewed that a little bit already the other day, but here's just a quick um, rundown of, of two new verbs uh, that are maybe kind of instructive, again, in terms of the first one having an inceptive perfective form. And then the second one is, again, a good example in the past, in, well, in the past and future, uh, right, this uh, aspectual distinction between being in the process of recovering versus fully recovering. Um, okay, so let's translate a couple of examples uh, with these distinctions in mind. Uh, she'll get well soon. Okay, sounds like a one-time thing. Ana skorre vuizdrevjet. Ana skorre vuizdrevjet, right? Uh, perfective future. She'll be recovering for a long time, right? It'll be a long recovery. That calls for the imperfective. Ana budget dolga vizdoravljivic. Ana dolga, right? Budget vizdoravljivic. Ana budit dolga vizdoravljivic. She'll be in that process for a long time. Number three, he was sick for an entire year. Okay, a long duration, right? This was a long ongoing process. Uh, on baliel right? He was sick for an entire year versus finally he got sick. Okay, that's the perfective of inception. On drug zabaliel. On drug zabaliel. He fell ill suddenly. Okay, another quick bit of review, right? A few uh, perfective forms, kind of some specialized vocabulary, are called simulfactives. And that simul is from the Latin meaning, it simply means once, right? Simulfactive means something is done once and only once, right? For example, uh, again, some more health-related examples here, kashlitz versus kashlinuitz, right? To cough or to be coughing versus to cough once, right? <clears throat> right, one cough, only one cough. Uh, so you see that that's, again, maybe a little bit different from, you know, someone completed coughing, they finished coughing or something you may typically have expected to see in a perfective verb, this is really something a little bit different. It's perfective in the sense that it's kind of over and done with, kind of one and done. But again, with these simulfactive verbs, uh, a lot of these, by the way, are related to sounds, right? So some someone makes a single sound once and only once. We can call that a simulfactive uh, perfective, describing a single quick action, especially a sound. So for example, ikat means something like to be hiccuping versus iknuit, which means to give a single hiccup, right? To produce a single hiccup sound. Another example, chichat means to be sneezing, to sneeze repeatedly or whatever, to be sneezing, uh, present tense, versus we could say someone chichnul, right? Chichnul meaning they sneezed once, right? Achu, right? Ktota chichnul, right? On chichnul, or ana chichnula. Uh, here are some common uh, phrases, right, for wishing good health. 
uh, we kind of, I think we've seen a few of these already, right? Budzdarov means literally be healthy. And we say that when someone sneezes, right? Uh, if it's a female, right, we're addressing using ty, we would say, of course, budzdarova. And if we were being polite or if multiple people sneeze, we would say budzdarovi, right? Hey, you all, are you polite? You vi be budzdarovi. If someone's sick and you want to say get well soon, well, you use the uh, Im, uh, the imperative or of, of this verb vizdaravlivich. And we say, for example, vizdaravlivich. And why are we using the imperfective there? Well, I think we could think of that as an, uh, what we could call an exhortative imperative, meaning we're we're really begging someone, hey, come on, get well, please get well, right? And also, we could also think of this as a polite command. We talked about that a bit, how a lot of these kind of kind of uh, formulaic, uh, polite imperatives often take the imperfective where we might normally expect the perfective, right? But anyway, just learn this as a kind of a set expression. Vuzdaravlivli, or the polite v form would be vuzdaravlivitsya. And you can also write that in emails, for example, if someone is um, sick. Okay, another, again, if you've done something rude, like maybe you've hiccuped or sneezed or something, incredibly rude like that. You could say, Izvini, or of course, Izvinitia, right? Excuse me. Again, another imperative. Okay, so what would you do if people do these things, right? Uh, you could practice this, right? Drugoy student chichnul, right? Another student has sneezed. What will you say to him? Okay, or again, we could change the gender. Drugoy studentka chichnula, Right, what, what will you say to this, this uh, female student? Okay, you, uh, you hiccuped loudly uh, behind the, well, literally behind the table, at the table. What should you say? I would guess, Izvinitia. Number three, Tvoy profesor ili shev zabaliel što your professor or your boss has fallen sick. What do you need to say? Well, we'd probably want to use V, and we'd say Vuzdaravlivitsya, right? Get well. What do they drink in Russia when they're sick in order to get well? Uh, well, <clears throat> there are multiple answers to that question, but maybe the most common one would be Chai, right? They drink tea. Or you may remember we mentioned, I think, chai smyodam, right? Uh, tea with honey, right? Put some honey in your tea for that for uh, that extra bit of um, health. Okay, uh, next question. Second number four is a bit of a typo there in the book. What do you usually drink when you're coughing and you want to get better? Well, again, we could say chai smyodam, right? Uh, tea with honey. Пять. Что можно сделать, чтобы перестать икать? What can you do in order to stop hiccuping? Right? What is your what is your folk remedy for uh, getting rid of hiccups? Uh, okay, let's look at it quickly at um, another bit of review, quick review of reflexive verbs. And again, let's learn some new ones uh, that are really some very nice examples here related to health. Lichits is lichits. Okay, let's talk first about aspect there. That's a really nice example. Lich, li, we could, you know, if we look this up, we may see something like, well, to, to, to heal. Um, but lichits, the imperfective, this is one of these cases where the aspectual distinction really almost calls for a completely different translation into English, right? Lichit means to treat someone. Is lichit means to treat successfully, that is to heal or to cure, right? So that's quite logical, right? But think for a, min for a moment how that uh, is reflected in the aspect of the Russian verb, right? Lichit, you're in the process of treating, you're trying to heal someone, we could say, but if we use the perfective verb, is lichit, that means you've completed uh, that task successfully, and the person has now been healed. Uh, now, we could add the reflexive particle, and we get a passive verb, for example, right, to be treated or to be healed, right, to undergo treatment, to be healed, to be cured. We would throw in the reflexive particle, sia. Okay, here's another interesting example. Let's start here 
with the reflexive verb, prestujarse, prestudirse means to catch a cold, right? Just to get some kind of, you know, whatever it is, the, the common cold, right? Now, again, we see that that's used uh, intransitively, meaning if you say I catch a cold, well, you can't catch someone else a cold, right? It's not really used in a transitive sense. Again, that means that it can't take a direct object. And again, in Russian, this is even more clear. Prestujarse, prestudice cannot take a direct object, right? The, the action of the verb is directed back at the subject, right? It's the subject itself who catches a cold. Now, interestingly, we can get rid of that sia, and we get, we're back to an ordinary transitive verb, which basically means to make someone else catch cold. And it's a little bit hard to translate that, right? Uh, so, for example, in Russian, you could say, Я простудил ребенка, meaning I made the child catch a cold. Maybe I took it outside in the driving rain or something, or I, God knows what I did to it. But anyway, prestudit means to, to, to give someone else a cold, to make, to cause someone else to catch cold. Finally, zarajat zarazit means to infect, and as we might guess, we add on a reflexive particle and we get a new verb, passive meaning to be infected, to, to, to get infected, right? Uh, so those are just some, some typical verbs, some new ones, and again, uh, we can think of them with or without the reflexive particle and see how the meanings change. Here are some more examples. Этот новый врач меня излечит. This new doctor will heal me uh, or cure me, right? He'll treat me successfully. Ты простудишь ребенка, right? You'll make the child catch cold. You'll get the child sick. Or мой друг заразил меня гриппом. My friend infected me with the flu, with grip, right? Instrumental. Okay, now let's add the particle and get examples of each of these verbs with a particle. Я долго лечился. I was undergoing treatment for a long time. Nakanets is lichilsia. Finally, I write it. It was completed. I was healed successfully. Astrojna to prestudishya. Right, be careful, or you'll catch cold. Right, uh, you will. You yourself will get a cold. Vsev grupia zarazilis gripam. Everyone in the group was infected. Right, passive. They were infected. And then, as so often happens with passive verbs, we get an instrumental, right? They were infected with the flu, or they got the flu. Okay, now remember one other uh, thing in terms of talking about active versus passive. You may remember an extremely common um, construction in Russian that we is sometimes called the third plural um, passive, although it's active. It's it's actually active, right? So, for example, меня долго лечили. Okay, there, look at that verb, lichili. That's a third plural form in the Russian. Note that the, the subject is basically an ani, right? There is no specific person or persons mentioned here. We just have this kind of an anonymous third plural verb. And again, because it, it doesn't emphasize uh, an agent, right, in, in the sense of a, an articulated subject, those, those constructions are often translated well into English as a passive, right? I was treated for a long time, or they treated me for a long time. Finally, I was healed, or finally they, right, this, whoever this they is, cured me. Nakanets is lichili. Okay, let's look at a few other. A second example, muy uvidimse zatra. There's a muy, that's a reflexive particle used to express reciprocity, right? You remember that little detail, right? Sometimes, um, Right, we will see each other, right? Reciprocity, uh, they're expressed with the sia. And finally, you may remember a fourth meaning of the reflexive particle to express spontaneity. You may remember that this is slightly problematic in terms of it, it, it's kind of a catch all category for other uses of the reflexive particle that uh, can't be understood in terms of passivity or reflexivity or reciprocity, right? Мой ребенок часто смеется. My child often laughs, right, where laughter might be thought of as a kind of spontaneous physio physiological reaction. Um, and perhaps for that reason, right, that's why Russian has the reflexive particle. A lot of verbs like that, remember, must be used with the particle. They, so in this case, we can't detach the сья, right, um, from the verb смеется. 
Okay, let's look at a few, uh, three more verbs. Uh, just again, very important in terms of health or actually life, life and death, right? Being born and dying. Uh, and let's just look at how, what's going on here, right? Anything unusual. Well, first we get rajaj radit, which means to give birth to. And again, we don't see a particle there. We could assume that that's uh, transitive, and again, meaning that it can take a direct object, right? You can give birth to a son, to a daughter, to a child, right? That verb is rajaj, again, radit, rajay, rajay, rajayet, raju, radish, radit, etc. Now, the more common verb is the verb with the reflexive particle, right? We add the particle, and we get a new verb meaning to be born, right? To be born. For example, raditsa, right? So, for example, ya radilsya, I was born on such and such a date, versus uh, she was born, and ya radilsya, ana radilais, on such and such a date. By the way, we'll learn how to express dates later uh, in this book when we, we have to learn numbers first. Okay, now just note, you might want to circle it in your book. It's not a typo. It may look like one, right? The reflexive verb is rajdatsa, right? We have a de cropping up there all of a sudden, um, basically because of discrepancies between native Russian um, mutations versus church Slavonic mutations. Okay, but be that as it may, right? We just have to learn that, th that this uh, is a quite slight discrepancy there. Now, again, the most common verb here by far, the most common form is raditsa, right? To ask when was someone born. And uh, so we'll be using that one a lot down the road. Now, the verb for dying is umirat, umiriet. And we see here a verb type that we, I don't believe we reviewed the other day, right? A non-syllabic er verb, like umiriet. Right, again, that forward slash is telling us that the stem here consists of some consonant plus er, with no vowel built into the stem, right? And indeed, we see that when we go to conjugate it, right? Umru, umrush, umrot, etc., right? Just mr, right? Uh, M, R, with no verb in between. Now, you'll often see, we'll talk about this more down the road, that the imperfectives of those verbs tend to insert an E in between those two um, consonants, right? So that's how we ended up with umirat, Right. We'll talk about that in a lot more detail, especially in book four, when we really learn how to derive imperfectives. That's a really useful topic. Okay, so let's just practice a few of these verbs. His wife gave birth to a son. Ivojena. Okay, now we need an active verb with a direct object. Radila, right? Ivojena radila. That's one of those verbs that takes the stressed a ah in the past tense. And now we need a direct object. Sina. Sin, right? Animate, masculine, animate. The accusative looks like a genitive. Yvojina radila sin. Number two, their son was born yesterday. Okay, again, that's passive, right? So we need to add the reflexive particle. Yvosin, sorry. Ich sin radilsia včera. Ich sin radilsia včera. Okay, so uh, again, hopefully at this point you're much more comfortable with when to use the reflexive particle and when not to use it. We spent several days studying that. Uh, so today, again, just a very quick review. If you need to, you might want to go back in book one and, and uh, review those lessons where we introduce the reflexive forms. Okay, number three versus four, let's think about aspect. Our dog was dying versus our dog died. Again, we talked about uh, how, strictly speaking, they're, they're really usually is no one-to-one -one correspondence between an English tense and Russian aspect, but there are some very handy guidelines, and this is one of the most reliable ones, right? If in English we use a past progressive, our dog was dying, right? That implies a process. That implies um, the use of the imperfective in Russian. So that would be our dog was dying would be nasha sabaka umirala, Versus our dog died, simple past. Okay, think about that. In English, that usually implies that the dog is now dead, right? That we, we kind of make that assumption when we hear usually a simple past verb in English, right? At least with no further context. So that's going to call, call for perfective. Nasha sabaka umirla. Nasha sabaka umirla. Okay, one last bit of review quickly. Uh, uh, subjectless verbs. 
We're going to see more examples of these down the road, but let's see if we can review quickly. What do we mean by a subjectless expression, including a subjectless verb? We mean two, two things we need to remember. Whenever you hear the word subjectless in a grammar lesson, number one, a subjectless expression has no subject. That's pretty obvious, right? It's subjectless. It has no subject. But let's think, what does that mean in terms of Russian grammar? No subject in Russian means no nominative case. Right, so if a sentence, if a verb, if a given expression does not involve a nominative, a word in the nominative, that means that it has no subject, right? It's a subjectless expression. Uh, so it would have to be, if we did include a, a noun with whatever expression, it would have to be in some other case, usually with the dative, sometimes with the accusative, but certainly not with the nominative. Okay, this second part of that is that um, a subjectless expression if it does include a verb, that verb will be, it will look like a, a neuter singular form of the verb, right? So, for example, in the past tense, the, the verb form would end in an or, right? Because, again, there is no subject. The verb form isn't going to be masculine or feminine because it doesn't have a masculine or feminine subject. It's always simply a neuter singular form, even though, again, there is no subject, not even a neuter singular one, right? But, again, the, the verb in a subjectless expression will look like it's neuter singular. Okay, so here, again, a couple of actually pretty useful verbs related to health, right? Um, uh, to be nauseated and to vomit. Okay, so excuse my, you know, the, our crudity here, but these are useful words, right? Uh, and they're both uh, used impersonally, or as we say in this book, subjectlessly, right? We talked a little bit about this back in book one, right? We said how it, maybe it's a bit odd in English that we say, uh, last night I drank too much and I vomited, right? When in fact, vomiting is typically a, a rather involuntary physiological process, right? So in some ways, the Russian is maybe more descriptive in making this something that grammatically happens to you, right? It's not something that you do, right? So again, these are a bit weird. And because these verbs are used subjectlessly, Again, that means that they're, they're going to look always like neuter singular verb forms. That means that there's a limited number of, of forms of these verbs, right? You see these tables are incomplete. For example, tashnit, that verb, the only two forms of that we could use would be tashnit in, in this present tense and past tense tashnila, tashnila, right? Um, so let's look at a couple of examples here. Minyatashnit means I feel sick, right? I feel nauseated. Now, again, look at that very carefully in the Russian. We, it, it's tricky, right? Because, again, it's hard to express this in English, right? In terms of what is the Russian grammar actually doing? In English, we say I feel sick, but in Russian, there is no I as the subject, right? There's some impersonal something or other, right? And we get this verb tashnit, meaning something like there is a being made sick, is maybe the, the closest way we could translate that. And the direct object of this being made sick is me, right? Uh, maybe we could say some, something like, there is a making me sick. There is a making me sick. Might be the closest thing in English we could, the closest English approximation of the Russian grammar. Now note that even in that, we're introducing a dummy subject there, right? There is a making me sick. Okay, anyway, uh, another example, perfective. Minyastashnila, mean I became nauseated. That usually implies that you vomited, right? You got sick, you became nauseated, and you vomited. Uh, so again, we see that this subjectless verb is used with a direct object, right, in the accusative, as is the verb for vomiting. Rybionka rvyot, rybionka rvyot means the child is vomiting, versus rybionka uh, virvyot, that would mean the child will vomit, right? Perfective here, future tense. Or past tense, by the way, would be rybionka virvola. The child vomited once, perfective. Again, we see that rybionik here is being used in the accusative with this subjectless verb. Uh, now again, note that the past tense would be virvala, right? Virvalo, or, right? Again, the form of the verb would look like a neuter singular form even though, again, there is actually no even neuter singular subject. There's no subject whatsoever. Okay, so that last topic is a really tricky one. Now, thankfully, there aren't really a whole lot of verbs that are used typically in this subjectless fashion. These are actually two of the very, uh, actually the most common examples I think 
that I can think of off the top of my head, right? So if you're feeling sick, keep in mind that the way you say that in Russian is going to be very weird grammatically. Although hopefully at this point, we've seen a number of subjectless expressions. And so maybe you're a bit more comfortable uh, processing that than, than you used to be. Uh, we'll talk, of course, more about them in the future. Okay, so that was quite a bit uh, to take in today. Again, most of it was was actually review, at least aside from the vocabulary. We learned a lot of new vocabulary today related to health, but the again, the we, we basically just looked and analyzed these new verbs and these new nouns in terms of um, things we already knew about Russian verbs and things that we're going to learn more about tomorrow when we study the nominative plural in detail. Okay, so until next time, до свидания, товарищи, и вперед к новым победам.